Uh, so welcome to this uh, last event of the local global virtual week. Uh, my name is Adonis Bikakis, uh, and uh, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Information Studies of UCL. And today's event is uh, a roundtable discussion on how museums uh, adapt to the needs, uh, expectations, challenges, uh, and opportunities of this virtual age. Uh, let me give you a brief uh, summary of what happened earlier this week. Uh, so we had, uh, on Tuesday, we had uh, a reading group organized by Tim Bisley Murray, um, which was on the Library of Babel uh, that Jorge Luis Borges wrote like 80 years ago, uh, in which he imagined an infinite library uh, that people spend their whole lives in. Uh, and this library contains all the books that have been written or will be written. Uh, so in other words, uh, a virtual place similar to today's internet. Then the second event of this week was uh, um, the screening of a recording of uh, Pina Bausch's version of uh, The Rite of Spring, uh, performed by a team of African dancers in, in Senegal. Um, Hélène Vauquinckenbach, the organizer of this event, had a conversation on Wednesday uh, with two of the artists that were involved in this performance. Uh, one of them was the leader of the, uh, of the, of the choreographic center in Senegal, and uh, the other one was uh, one of the dancers. And they discussed questions about uh, the role of place, uh, the local uh, culture and the audience in such performances, and uh, how these, the recent traveling restrictions um, have impacted uh, these live arts performances. Now, today we will focus on, um, on another part, another aspect of our culture, museums. I have the pleasure to have in the panel today uh, four excellent researchers uh, who have worked on different aspects uh, of the topic of today's discussion, museums in the virtual age. So we have Professor Tim Jordan, uh, a professor of digital cultures and director of UCL's program in arts and sciences. We have Angela Antonio, an assistant professor at the Department of uh, Archival, Library and Information Studies uh, of the University of West Attica and an honorary, honorary research associate of UCL. We have Fotiniva Leonti, uh, an uh, AHRC Innovation Leadership Fellow at the UCL Department of Information Studies, and Dr. Kat Braybrook, a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Sussex. So thank you all for accepting my invitation uh, to this panel. And, and to begin with, uh, can I please invite each of you to say uh, a few words of the research that you have done in this area, uh, starting with Tim. Thank you very much, Antonis, and thank you very much for everyone for coming along on this Friday night. Um, when you might be thinking about other things and getting into the weekend, uh, hopefully we'll get you off to a good start. I've been researching the digital and internet technologies or what are sometimes called the virtual for some time since the early 1990s. And there's a couple of strands of work in there. I've had quite a bit to do with looking at kind of grassroots movements, particularly hackers um, and particularly politically motivated hackers or hacktivists as they're, they're sometimes called. Alongside that, I've also developed, uh, again, in a way, looking at um, grassroots developments uh, or deep non-institutionalized developments in the virtual, I've put a certain amount of effort into examining um, gaming communities and online gaming. Um, the last uh, couple of big projects that I'd undertaken were an attempt to look at what we might think of as the characteristic politics of information in the, uh, in, in the digital or the virtual age, uh, in which I looked at a kind of range of things from you know, the politics of the, of the iPad through to looking at social media and uh, security agencies, uh, securitization of the internet. And just um, earlier this year, I completed uh, the last project which I was doing, which was an attempt to really examine the nature of the digital economy. So I looked at search, social media, um, the Ubers and Airbnbs, free software, gaming, and so on, all in the context of trying to look at the kind of economic practices that might constitute them as a particular um, digital form of economic uh, interaction. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Tim. Uh, Angela, can you say a few words about your research? Yes, thank you. Thank you for organizing and for this invitation. Um, for the last 18 years, I'm only working with cultural informatics. 
and I have a background in music psychology education and human computer interaction, which I actually studied at UCL. And it was uh, one of the most uh, best times of my life, really. I really miss it. And I think this background allows me to introduce social sciences and arts in the design of cultural technologies. I'm very much interested in the personal characteristics of the visitors, of the cultural visitors. And I'm also interested in the group dynamics that emerge in physical museums, but in also in virtual museums. Um, I have participated in many um, national and EU projects, uh, cultural informatics, and I would like to take this opportunity to talk a little bit about one, the one um, the project we did together with UCL, and that was called CrossCult. Uh, the CrossCult project was uh, it finished last year, and it, it was aiming at reusing digital cultural heritage to show interconnections among pieces of cultural heritage and different visitors' viewpoints. Um, the final goal was to stimulate reflection and to support multiple interpretations of the past. We had four main pilots, and um, uh, one of them was uh, the National Gallery in London, where we used the different paintings there to show different aspects of the European history. We had another pilot that tried to connect two different cities, UNESCO uh, cities. It was um, Valletta in Malta and uh, Luxembourg. And we tried to show how these cities have been affected with population movement in antiquity in medieval times and today. And uh, we also had one big pilot try to connect four different uh, cultural heritage sites, three Roman uh, baths and one, uh, um, one archeological site in Greece. So it was one Roman bath in uh, Spain, in, uh, in Portugal, one in Italy and one in Greece. And we tried to show the different uses, the therapeutic uses of water in antiquity and access to health services in antiquity and today. And the final pilot was implemented at a small museum in Greece, which is very much unknown to the public. And we try to make it known and attract more people and try to connect the content with, uh, especially with the content of the National Gallery in London. So there were a lot of uh, things that you could see at the gallery, like myths and um, uh, different aspects of uh, Greek mythology, really how they are depicted in the different paintings. And we had similar content at the museum. So we tried to make those connections. So um, this is what I've been doing over the last year. So thank you very much. Yeah, and that was a very successful and great project. And I say that because I also took part in this project. Uh, but uh, but anyway, that was that was actually uh, my chance to do uh, to do some research in this area. But because my background is in computer science, so so that that project gave me the opportunity to uh, to, to 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 do some work in this area and and see how all these different kinds of technologies can be applied in this. Uh, in, in, in museums and other kinds of uh, cultural heritage venues and what great things we can do with them. Uh, so, okay, enough about CrossCult, about advertising CrossCult. Uh, it's over now anyway. And uh, Fotini, can you say a few words about your research? Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a great honor to be part of, uh, and, and I'm very, yeah, to be part of this discussion of this panel. Um, so my background, similar to Antonis, is also in computer science. I specialized in digital media and uh, my PhD project at the UCL um, is a platform called Museum. So the title of my PhD is Museum Making Art Easily Accessible with Crowdsourcing and Gamification. Uh, Museum.org is essentially a virtual museum um, and a picture gallery, what we would call a pinacotheque in German, pinacotheca in Italian. We don't have something similar in, in English. That's, so it's a uh, virtual museum with uh, paintings, drawings, and illustrations, uh, an art gallery. And uh, it exhibits about 100,000 artworks. It receives every day uh, 3,000 visitors on a daily basis. And its whole purpose is to make art easily accessible. Um, through by allowing people to find so if we look up accessibility on the dictionary it says to be easily obtained to be easily used so we uh, try uh, try to discover ways to uh, allow people to use those artworks so on museum uh, you can uh, through the open glam movement you can download artworks that have been completely copyright vetted 23,000 images of uh, copyright vetted paintings of old masters and uh, van gogh and rembrandt and and uh, hundreds of great uh, masterpieces you can even send artwork as, as e-cards uh, and i've done a lot of work in copyright to clear that because apart from old, old masters 
We also have nearly 2,000 contemporary artists from all around the world. So museum.org is still alive, uh, still alive. Yeah, as I mentioned, long past, which is already two years, uh, two years, uh, three years since my Viva. Um, and now I am an uh, AHRC uh, Innovation Fellow. Uh, so my current research is about uh, helping museums um, uh, address arguably their, their top, top challenge, which is the financial difficulties, increasing financial difficulties, and that was before COVID. So COVID-19 made things even worse. And so my current project is about finding ways to use the digitized collections of museums, the digitization, for, uh, to, to get uh, an economic benefit out of it. So to allow museums to generate an, an additional source of revenue through by taking advantage of their digitized collections, but so reaping the economic benefits of digitization. So. Okay, thank you very much, Fotini. And this is very relevant to our discussion today. So, so your input will be valuable. Uh, Kat, can you say a few words about your work? Sure, thanks. It's really nice to be here tonight. Uh, so my research looks at dynamics of power, agency, and access in digital cultures and spaces, uh, sort of including maker and hacker communities like Tim and one strain of this research is the decolonization of museums in the UK through digital participation and creative methods. So my doctoral research with the University of Sussex Digital Humanities Lab looked at user experiences at the UK's first spaces for digital participation in museums. And I worked with Tate Modern, Tate Britain, the British Museum and the Wellcome Collection who all have really great sort of public digital spaces that you can go into. And I found that the experimental practices of these spaces were shifting the logics of their host museums from within by helping them become more, more open, more participatory and more creative. Uh, so I'm also uh, a digital anthropologist um, and I did my master's at UCL as well and really loved it and really miss uh, being there. And I'm the director of a design studio called We and Us, which works with public institutions around the world to engage their communities better through creative and digital participation methods. Uh, and I've worked in the tech industry for over a decade for different organizations like Mozilla doing sort of open source technology practices. And so I'm now on a COVID-19 rapid response team at King's College London, which is currently in the process of prototyping a series of alternative and remote cultural experiences for isolated and vulnerable publics who aren't able to go into museums due to COVID-19 circumstances in both London and in Tokyo. So we've been working with cultural producers at museums across the UK from the National Gallery X to the Cambridge Fitzwilliam Museum to prototype new ideas for how to access these publics through a series of digital design sprints that are on Zoom. So they look a lot like this one. Uh, and they've been running over a period of six weeks and some of the outputs have included plans for a VR festival where people can use at hand devices such as you know, Google Glasses uh, that you can make out of cardboard, um, and also a free phone landline theater initiative for those who aren't online. So thank you. So thank you very much, Kat. Uh, this is all very interesting and your input will also be valuable because of your you know, both research and professional experience in this area. Uh, you said that you, know, you miss UCL, we also miss UCL because we are not actually there, <laughs> okay? Most of us at least, anyway. Uh, so before you know, before we proceed to uh, to the discussion, let me just remind the audience that uh, they can they, they can use uh, the Q and A function uh, of Zoom to make any questions uh, they want. You can make your questions at any point. Uh, we will uh, discuss them at the end, at, towards the end of our of our discussion. But if any of these questions is is relevant, we can also discuss it while we're discussing uh, the list of questions that. Uh, we, we already have uh, here. So, um, so okay. So let's let's begin with with the first. Topic. I mean, okay. The general topic, uh, as we discussed, is the museums in the individual age and uh, how museums uh, adapt to the to the challenges and and, and the needs uh, of this new age of this new age. Um, and I'll start with a question to to Tim. So, Tim, what do you think that uh, are the pressures on museums uh, related to this rise of digital and virtual technologies? Great, thank you. Well, it's a big question and I'm going to answer it uh, not with a history, but just by pointing out that 
the virtual, um, which uh, by which I'm taking to be the kind of all the innovations we associate with digital and internet technologies, um, the virtual brings with it a number of pressures, and I'm going to highlight three of them. And I'm not going to be that specific about which technology and, and what phase and, and so on. I'm going to say that these are all pressures that come across and that historically we can see pretty much from the beginning of the internet and which we can see continuing to develop. It's not to say that everything's the same, but these are kind of broad kind of, I'm afraid, slightly high level kind of pressures. And those are going to be um, a, pressures, a, a pressure coming from a kind of economy of free, um, pressures coming from an economy of sensations, and pressures coming from an economy of connections. And I'm very briefly going to introduce each of those, each of which I think provides a different kind of pressure on a museum. And by pressure, I don't necessarily mean negative. It can be something that the museum can feel is something that they want to take up and can be positive. So the internet clearly produces um, an economy of free stuff. And that's in a couple of aspects. One of those aspects is um, just that uh, in the digital economy, um, a number of large for-profit companies uh, have managed to find ways in which they can give away the product that they mainly produce and still produce significant um, income from it. So if you think of Google or Facebook, they give away the main service. The main reason you go to Google is to search. They give that away for free and they turn that the data they collect from that into targeted advertising that we all become increasingly familiar with. Um, there's also a second aspect in which we start to expect the products of the world around us of the digital to be given away free, which is that there's a whole movement um, around deriving primarily from free software and something Kat mentioned around things like Mozilla, which produces the Firefox browser, um, where people come together to kind of produce content, whether it's through coding, um, whether it's on Wikipedia, um, and so a number of kind of services that in the past people would have had found that they were walled out of, for example, encyclopedias, which um, you used to have to buy, um, now are available free. And that produces a context in which museums um, worldwide um, have to consider how they're going to provide that kind of access to things when there's whole generations now who, 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 who experience um, significant free access to things. Museums also come under pressure, um, and this is a pressure which really is, isn't just, didn't just start with um, the virtual, but came through um, TV, theme parks, films, a pressure towards sensation, a pressure, but I would say that the, the virtual produces an intensification of that, a kind of Netflixization of um, access to uh, all kinds of things. If you Take up a sub, if you take up Spotify these days, you can have access to extraordinary amounts of music all of a sudden um, uh, that you would not have had before. And in that sense, you also have museums and um, places uh, that, that reflect this kind of intense, this kind of intensification of sensation, uh, kind of slightly moving to each other. So museums feel sometimes a need to respond to this. Um, you might think, um, I don't know if many of you will, but if, if you look up an artist called Olafur Eliasson, who had a, a really interesting exhibition in Tate Modern um, uh, a little while ago, a year or so ago, then several of the parts of that were, for me, very close to what you might have expected to get in a theme park. Um, Another example would be if you go to the Warner Brothers studio tours in Watford, which you basically experiencing what presents itself as an entertainment facility or a place of entertainment, but runs something like a kind of sensationalist um, history of the Harry Potter movies. Um, and so you have these kinds of pressures. Behind all of that clearly is, is the biggest sensation pressure, which is the games industry and the whole idea of gamification and how you can engage people um, particularly younger people who are coming up and living through um, uh, childhoods that are, are marked strongly by, by games of, of various sorts. The gaming industry itself now runs very much, not entirely, but a large proportion of the gaming industry also runs on free to play kind of economic models. So I think it's around 90% of mobile games that you play on your mobile phone are free to play economic models. The last thing we should mention is that there is also um, the issue of the kind of economy of connection. And here we have to think a little bit and also think a little bit about the, the, the economy of free stuff in relationship to UK museums in, 
specifically, because UK museums are funded by the government to provide free access to standing collections. Um, and that means that they're under pressure from the government to ensure that those standing collections and the money they're given to maintain those and, and to maintain free access gets them beyond the usual moviegoer who, um, sorry, movie, I meant, I meant museum goer, not movie goer, the usual museum goer, um, often being um, better educated, uh, whiter, older, um, and more financially at, advantaged in society. And so museums are under pressure uh, to get beyond that core audience that museums have always had in the UK. Whereas overseas, museums might be worrying about um, theme parks or games attracting people because they have to, you have to pay for entry. In the UK, there's a slightly different dynamic. Here, the economy of connection, the economy of social media, the ability to reach out to people, to have email lists, to uh, become something that some museums may well see as, as an opportunity. Um, and they see it as an opportunity in a couple of ways. One is widening participation, of, as, as I've mentioned, but also widening um, contributions. So when I mentioned the economy of free stuff, one of the things I mentioned is the way there are a range of kind of grassroots movements where people are constructing things themselves. Any of us can go and edit and contribute to Wikipedia. At the same time, you'll have examples, for example, the British Library for some time has run a number of crowdsourcing projects. I'll just mention one of them, which was it had it has a large collection of maps. It's trying to work out um, for some of those maps where they actually refer to and so it's been outsourcing people identifying recurrent features on maps in their local areas so that they can identify which maps over time might cover. So there might be a particularly shaped river that appears on a map. If someone can locate that particular shape in a series of maps, contribute that back. So there's a kind of gamification that goes with that. There's prizes, there's uh, little stars and things like that. So that's both a challenge for museums because there's a sense in which we all expect a kind of connection um, that is being brought to us through social media and things like that but it's also potentially for some reason for some museums seen as, as as a way out as a kind of general thing that that they're not sometimes necessarily sure what they're going to do with it and how they're going to make it work but surely there's something they can do with this which will start to attract different categories of people to come to museums so to conclude, I'd just say that the virtual then in this sense has rather high level pressures on museums. I've highlighted three of them. Um, and those high level pressures come out in rather specific ways in specific contexts. But I hope you uh, I've said enough that you could see what those kind of pressures would mean for museums. Thank you. Yeah, the, yeah thank you. This is very interesting. So do you think that, you know, the people's expectations or the, uh, you know, the expectations of, of the uh, museum audience have changed? um so much you know recently or or in the last uh you know since uh, since the tv was invented or or uh, you know even more now with all these different kinds of games and social networks and so on so did people expect more from museums now um uh, yes i think so and i think people compare them to other things if you think of the um, if you just think of the series of um, turbine hall exhibitions in tate modern one of them was a series of slides um, which my children very gleefully slid down two or three stories um, which were placed in there, but it turned it into a kind of theme park kind of kind of they were quite beautiful in their own way, a very silver kind of curved shape, but they were they were literally slides that you could get into and slide down in the middle of the museum. Um, and so I think there are some attempts. Some of this is the perception of the museum and people who work in museums about what they think people would want. Some of it is the pressure to get outside of um, what has stubbornly remained the same museum audience. Um, so we might talk about perceptions of um, people having different attitudes, and I think that's true. But for museums, part of their problem is that their audience has stayed rather stubbornly the same and that they're under some pressure, both for ethical reasons. It's not just kind of, I, I mentioned government policy pressure and economic pressure. Um, I wouldn't want to, that's right, I wouldn't want to give the impression that museums, that's all they think about, but certainly they think about that because they have to, but also for ethical reasons and because they'd really love to, to, to get beyond it. And you will see efforts along that line. It's not a particularly virtual or digital exhibition, but people might have noticed the famous um, film director and artist Steve McQueen's last big exhibition where he went round London and took pictures of 
I can't remember what it was, grade six, I think it was, um, all across London, and then made an exhibition out of a picture of all of them and made sure that all the schools at that level were invited to come in and see. So there was a definite effort to get beyond your normal audience there, but to integrate that into, to, to get those people to feel that they're participating in the artwork. And that was one where it wasn't particularly digital in its technologies, um, but it definitely picked up on that idea of participatory involvement in art, which has a longer history in, in art and art theory than it does just in relation to the digital, but I think has crossed over that sense in which um, we feel we can participate in these things. Okay, thank you very much, Tim. And uh, so, so you already started giving some examples, but I would like you know, uh, um, a broader discussion on this. What are the museums trying to do uh, in, in response to this, to this uh, pressure? So, uh, Angela, uh, I can see you raise your hands. Can you please give us an answer to that? Just, uh, just can I ask a quick question to Tim? Because yeah. I found the um, analysis brilliant. Do you, would you say that there are also um, pressures from within? Like uh, the way you say, it, it's like the, the museum personnel themselves, sometimes they resist to this change, to the digital change and believing that their um, audience, their audience doesn't want any change. So I think that there is also pressures from within the organization. Would you agree with that? I think so. I think Kat might have um, something to say about this because her research really uncovered some very interesting uh, perspectives that. And so I might leave leave the effect of the kind of digital in it to her but I would just say one thing and it's one thing that might be a COVID pressure which is that museums have the real object there and I think um, when you whether we'll find I, I certainly I've been back to face-to-face -to -face teaching and I have uh, uh, on campus and I have really enjoyed having students in the classroom with me even though we're all we got masks on and we're all keeping distant and all that kind of stuff it was really nice and I wonder whether one of the tricks museums might play is that rather conservative reflex they have which is here's the Rosetta Stone keep it under glass that's why people come here whether in fact there might be a response to COVID which is actually it's quite nice to go and see the real thing in the real world. Thank you. Thank you. So I think Kat, we will uh, continue. Yeah, Kat, do you have anything more to say on that? Mm -hmm. I'm sure you do. Yeah, I was just trying to figure out how to raise my hand and then realized I forgot. So thank you for just uh, giving me the space. Um, yeah, I, I, it's interesting because when I was working with uh, museums like the British Museum a few years ago, sort of before COVID, uh, the staff that I was speaking to were saying that it was a real struggle for them to push digital programs because they were often sort of uh, pushed aside and deprioritized and seen as not that important because publics were coming into the museum in such mass numbers. Whereas now I think there's been a massive shift where every museum has been forced to realize how important digital engagement and participation is. And also I think we're seeing museums broaden their reach as much as they can to reach and access publics who are outside of the museum. Whereas before sort of the digitization of museum practices was seen as only within the walls of museums like the British Museum. Now the British Museum is looking into the streets and into people's homes and seeing how you know VR and AR and other types of new technologies can can access those of us who can't actually reach the museums anymore. So I think it's just, it's an exciting moment for museum staff who are on digital programs and digital learning teams who've been sort of ignored for a long time. And and I think it's a, it's very exciting as well for those who due to you know, being immunocompromised or for many other reasons have actually been cut off from museums for, for many years. I think now there's, there's a renewed interest in, in access and, and inclusivity that we haven't seen before. Thank you very much, uh, Kat. I mean, we'll go back to this topic again about the people who work in, in this uh, sector and, and uh, uh, how do they adapt to, this, to these uh, changes. But uh, let's go back to the museums again. Okay, so we talked about all these pressures. Tim gave some examples of, of, of what they do. So, Angela, what is your general feeling? I mean, how do the museums uh, cope with these pressures? How, how, what is their response? How do they respond to these pressures? What do they actually do? Mm -hmm. I would like to talk about this in two parts. The one is what they do now, and the other thing is what I hope they will do in the future. Um, I think most of the ideas I already have, have been already covered by Tim and Kat, that you have said quite some things that I was also thinking, but 
it seems to me that the type of museum affects the response. Uh, there are certain museums like science ones, science ones that they seem to be very quick adapters of technology. And in fact, you have a lot of cutting edge technology that is tried there and tested. Uh, first time in museums like this, like social robots. But you have other museums like archaeological museums, and this is definitely the case in Greece, for example, that there are very late adopters of technology. And um, they don't seem to be convinced that they really need technology and they, they believe that their audience doesn't need it, as Tim said. So, um, so uh, however, the pandemic, of course, is, is showed that they very much need it and they're very much dependent on technology. So very quickly and sometimes very dramatically overnight, they were taken by surprise, they had to, they were panicking, they had to do something to attract new audience and to respond to the pandemic situation. So what we saw during spring 2020, we saw an 80% increase of our museum's online presence across Europe. And then we saw a 40% increase of the online visitors. But if you have the qualitative analysis on these numbers, you will see that the, most of the people that visited this uh, online uh, uh, places, they only spend a few seconds there. And why that is, so I believe technology changes the very nature of the activity in cultural heritage. And we cannot treat it just like another tool to showcase our content. We need to specifically design for this content and we need to specifically de design for the digital engagement. So I think museums now are going through this phase after the shock they had in spring, they're trying now to, un to understand and to adapt to this new reality and see how they can use these digital uh, tools to attract and engage visitors. So the other thing museums are doing, uh, they're trying to solve the uh, content licensing issues, as Tim said. Uh, although this is very much solved in other industries like gaming industries and music industries, in cultural heritage, we're still facing huge challenges that become even more complicated when we include software into the game. So um, we have issues with content licenses, and this is something I think museums are struggling right now. And the other thing is the participation in research projects. I think today a lot of museums, the way to respond to these uh, challenges is by trying to participate in different research projects. But I believe that they do it just to get the funding. The funding is what attracts them. Um, I don't believe they're actually really um, convinced that they will use this technology because personally I have never seen a, a solution has been designed inside the project to be used afterwards in the museum, uh, with the normal visitors outside the project. So I think although they are attracted to different projects, I think they do it for the funding and not because they're truly, truly uh, convinced that they actually need this technology. So uh, what I think they will do in the future? Um, I think in the future, um, they will hopefully try to uh, participate in projects and actions that will target societal needs. And um, uh, Tim said it before that they have to apply cultural democratization methods. Uh, to break this elitist approach uh, to cultural and cultural heritage. They need to open up to the community. They need to attract more people. You can't have the white um, middle-aged male uh, audience anymore. You need to attract more people. And um, uh, they will, by doing this, they will hopefully enhance social cohesion. They will help the communities deal with challenges and threats. So now consider the COVID crisis so many people started Googling Spanish flu. Why did they do that? They did it because they want to find answers for what they are experiencing today. So cultural heritage can give them an um, answer in uh, challenges they face in their life. So um, I think another more uh, long-standing threat is in the societies is the environmental one. And this is a threat that is coming. So I think cultural institutions and museums will have to work with the environmental crisis and see how they could be um, included into these uh, actions. Uh, because cultural heritage can again teach us um, how to ha have, for example, sustainable farming, reusable sources of energy, basically how to avoid the mistakes of the past. So I think museums can play a very active role in this, in uh, helping us uh, deal with our, and face our uh, the different challenges. So I think finally, uh, museums need to explore further these hybrid scenarios Kat said, because we need to involve people and see how we can do it. 
uh, and for example, how we can support social interactions during a pandemic and how it can have, uh, how we can simultaneously support online and on-site visitors interactions. So we need to start experimenting with new hybrid scenarios and uh, try to see how we could involve people under different circumstances and to remember that the museum experience is not just learning gains, is also socialization, is communication, is interaction, is entertainment, is all these things. So um, just by releasing content online, we don't cover the other needs. So we need to experiment more with these hybrid scenarios and see how we could proceed. So thanks. Thank you, Angela. I mean, one point that you made is that and this is impressive that, you know, we had this 80%. Uh, well, it's not impressive considering that we're all now at our homes. So we visit everything online. So maybe it's not impressive that, uh, you know, the, uh, the visits uh, to, the, to their online sites increased by 80%, you said? 40%, but they, the museums increased their digital presence by 80%. Okay, but okay. So, but about the fact that, you know, that most of these visits were for, for you know, a few seconds. What does this mean? I mean, is it is it you know the type of people who visited these these museum sites that, or or is it that uh, the museums didn't do anything to keep them engaged? What do you think? I think it's both. Is um, is uh, people the, the site did not attract them, did not engage them further. They went there out of curiosity. They just looked at the content and they went. But um, this is why the content needs to be specially designed for attracting and engaging visitors. So I think it was a quick response to the, to the pandemic situation. They had to release content quickly online, but just how many, personally, can I just go and see painting after painting after painting online? It doesn't give me much. So, um, uh, so I think the content was not properly designed. It's not a matter of uh, quantity of uh, artworks you can show, but it's the quality of the experience you can provide. So I don't think that most of them were not ready to provide the right quality of experience to engage the visitors further. Okay, thank you very much, Angela. Um, okay, let's let's go back to the you know to the people who work in this sector. Uh, so how you know all, all the people like cultural producers practitioners and so on how have how have they all changed and how do they adapt uh, to this uh, you know new situation so kat maybe you have something to say on that sure yeah i mean i i, I would say that sort of like the rest of us right now most cultural producers are quite overwhelmed by the new state of things and sort of running to catch up and in particular, they're faced with precarious working conditions, low pay and furloughing. So, so not being able to go into their jobs for long periods of time, that, that's changing now as museums reopen. But I would say they're also responding through creative experimentation in ways that are quite interesting and are trying to involve publics in new ways with cultural offerings around sort of the limits of COVID-19. So we're seeing this through initiatives like the COVID Creatives Toolkit, um, which I can share a link in the chat about. Um, so this is a mutual aid resource that was created for creative practitioners by creative practitioners, uh, including artists, makers, curators, hackers, and facilitators. And I, I brought this together in the very early days of COVID-19, trying to find something helpful to do, along with 30 other creative practitioners from around the world, and many others joined us. And what we were trying to do was help those who were finding themselves having to migrate their practice onto digital spaces and very quickly, um, which many people were finding very overwhelming at the time. And many of those who helped build and maintain that toolkit in their spare time were actually cultural producers who were working at major museums in London, but who had been furloughed, so they weren't able to go into their jobs. And another cool thing about the toolkit was that other than the fact that it has compiled mostly free and open source resources from digital organizing and gathering platforms to self-care spaces online was the fact that it was also an experiment in collective organizing around a crisis and what that could look like, which many of us hadn't really experienced before. I've, I've been lucky enough to not really be in crisis situations for most of my life. And it does give me hope that these kinds of sort of community initiatives that have emerged, not only within museums, but also outside of them, around COVID-19 can help us fight isolation in long term. So we're also seeing cultural workers organize increasingly for collective workers' rights around COVID-19. So protests have been happening at institutions around London, like Tate, in the face of mass layoffs. 
uh, which are disproportionately impacting on BAME staff in particular. And I would say these are really important developments because they do help remind museums of the importance of caring not only for their publics and trying to bring more diverse publics into the, the walls of museums, but also for their workers. And I do hope that collective organizing initiatives like these will also invite more diverse people to come into museums in London because there is still a correlation between museum participation, race and class. And many people in London still do not feel that museums are for them, even though they're free. So I do think that you know these kinds of initiatives can help make that change. Sure, thank you very much, Kat. And and uh, Kailobi just shared the, the link to the COVID creative tool, creative toolkit that you mentioned, uh, which uh, yeah, it's 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 great. I mean, uh, I looked at it, and and I you know I would encourage everyone to have a look at it. It's it's uh, it's really very interesting. Um, so, uh, can you still hear me? Just because I have some problems with my connection. Sorry, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kat. Okay, so we've talked a lot about you know the pressures, the challenges, and 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 uh, how uh, museums respond to it. Also, the pressures on the people uh, who, who who work in this in this sector. Uh, maybe we can also you know be a little bit. Yeah, thank you for sharing that link, Kat. Uh, talk a little bit about. We can talk a little bit also about about the opportunities. And the opportunity is that uh, the museums, the uh, and more generally uh, the cultural heritage sector, uh, hasn't still uh, realized that that there hasn't real, re it hasn't really benefited from these opportunities yet. So, do you think, Fotinia, and I want to ask uh, to ask you because you're you're doing some research in this in this area. Uh, what do you think that you know? What opportunities do these technologies bring to museums and to this sector? In in general, uh, that that uh, you know the museums haven't still exploited, and what do you think that they could do about it? Yeah, so um, so yeah, as I mentioned previously, my my background is in computer science, and but my passion is in the in cultural heritage. So I've always been fascinated by that. How many how 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 many great things museums can do with digital, and this goes a long way back. So even from my ma during my masters, which was. To uh, my MFA between 2009 and 2011, uh, my my thesis, my topic at the time was how museums can take advantage of augmented reality, and coming from Greece originally, especially for archaeological museums, um, I couldn't uh, I didn't even um, I couldn't get my head around why museums are not jumping on it, um, because uh, imagine you know you you go to Archaeological, you know, it's all about context. And when you visit an archaeological museum, you see a piece of stone that is rectangular somewhere up high. And then, but the minute you realize through, you know, you go through the information, or even better through augmented reality, you see this is actually the chest of a huge sculpture of Poseidon, which was, you know, so it's 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 always all about context. So uh, back then, what and it was still early days for augmented reality. So no one could judge museums why they are not jumping on this opportunity. Now, a decade later, things are better, but still we wouldn't say, you know, it's a, you know, you go, you walk into an archeological museum and, you know, the, you see some AR installations around. And anyway, at that stage, I realized that um, uh, museums are late adopters of technology. You know, they, if you take the Gaussian, the normal distribution, they are always, you know, at the very end. And uh, so I completely understand. Uh, so, and, and, that, and that is, you know, as I completely understand what Kat mentioned that from British Museum staff working on digital felt, you know, they, the mu museums, you know, they, they, they didn't take digital too seriously. And uh, so when I, I looked into it, I realized there were two reasons for that. The first is that museums are not the most well funded, you know, institutions in the, we take all industries in the, in the world, you know, technology first uh, is applied in the army, you know, the military was doing AR 30 years ago, and then it's always the most wealthy industries that uh, jump onto uh, things, you know, uh, new, new tools, new technologies. And even uh, if we talk about big, big museums, so I had been in a workshop at the British uh, Museum back then, and 
to do some sort of AR, which is you know one of the most well-funded museums in the UK and I guess in Europe, uh, they were relying on a sponsorship for, for um, Samsung, for uh, some devices. So still, they, they didn't, they, even a well-established, well-funded museum didn't have much money to spend. And so first is because museums are not very well-funded. And the second reason why museums are late adopters of technology is because if we look into the, um, if we look into the, the definition, what, what is a museum? If we look at their mission, you know, their mission is to collect, to preserve, to conserve, to educate, educate and so engagement or um, nothing, uh, digital doesn't really fit directly there. Anyway, it's still, you know, super powerful tool. So most museums that could afford it were trying to find ways to make something out of it. The thing is, as it was mentioned previously, uh, COVID brought that reality a lot closer, you know. So digital all of a sudden became everything, became the exhibition, the engagement, the education, the, the means to do everything. So anyway, my research now and... Uh, um, focuses on finding ways to not just use digital, but another super valuable resource museums have at their disposal. And this is their digitized collections. So for, a, as mentioned previously, not a particularly well-funded uh, industry, uh, there's been such a vast amount of money invested in digitization. So only uh, if we take Europeana alone, the fact that from 20, 2014 through to 2020, Europeana was investing 10 million euros every year in the digitization of collections uh, of the glam sector systematically, like if, in six years. And just, this is just one initiative. This has resulted to all museums, big and small, uh, owning a, a vast amount of uh, valuable data, you know, a super high res professional professional digitization of their collections. And their collections is a, a, a works of notable, you know, no, notable works because they belong in a museum collection. So they don't just have a digitized photo of something. They have uh, the digitized, uh, digitized artifact that, you know, has some value. So, and professional digitization is expensive. So if we look at museums outside Europe, they struggle to digitize their collections because there aren't such initiatives. So in North America, they have to do serious fundraising in order to properly digitize, digitize their collections. And so, yeah, so my, uh, my, my current, pro so I see that from two different perspectives. So how digitize to, for the benefit of museums and then for the benefit of the end users. So for the benefit of museums, that's what my current fo project focuses on, uh, my fellowship, to um, find ways museums can use their digitization to generate revenue. So what this has concluded to is to is essentially a, a highly evolved version of print on demand for museums. So at the moment, if uh, we think about print on demand for museums, we usually think of well-funded institutions. So I walk into Tate Britain and then there's th this big screen that allows me to select an artwork, select a frame, you know, purchase and order it home. And uh, this has been the case for the last uh, for the last decade. So not much has changed. So in my project, my current project, um, it all happened through your own smartphone. So you visit a mobile. Uh, it's a web app, so it feels like a native app, but it's not uh, an app. You just visit through browser, and as you walk through the galleries, you using your own phone through this you know web app, which is essentially an, a, a website that doesn't reload anyway, so that it feels like a native app. And if you come across a painting that you like, you can uh, take the a picture of the painting or a, pic a picture of the label, depending on the uh, photo, photo you know photograph policy of the museum. And once the artwork is identified, then you can select what you want to buy this uh, artwork on. So you can buy it as a print, you can buy it as a t-shirt, you can buy it as a tote bag. And then you design the product yourself because you, you, know, you cannot automatically place any sort of image on any kind of product. 
people, you know, you can scale, you can pan, you can position the artwork on your own bag, on your own t-shirt, and then you check out and then uh, museums take some profit out of it. So essentially the project is to open up all those benefits of print on demand, which is that you can start selling without investing anything upfront um, to all museums and especially to museums who need it most. And this is uh, small, medium-sized museums. Because at present, print-on-demand was just for wealthy institutions, for those museums that can afford to establish a contract with a print-on-demand supplier who will install this big screen, who will build them a custom uh, print-on-demand website. Uh, and uh, you know, then the museums would have to maintain the hardware. They would have to pay the supplier for maintenance of this custom e-shop they created for them. So yeah, so this project is to open up the benefits of print on demand for all museums, so that museums can start benefiting from the digitized collections. And uh, so my other project, which is, so from the from the from the end user's perspective, uh, seeing all this, you know, seeing the emergence of op open glam, which now counts many 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 institutions. So the open glam movement is the you know museums. Uh, just to, to mention briefly. So museums have received a lot of criticism why they still sell licenses for images of uh, paintings that are out of copyright. So Titian died, uh, El Greco died 400 years ago. Why do you charge image fees on an image of one of his paintings? And anyway, it, they, you know, the museums would hold on to the, the copyright of the photograph. And uh, about a decade ago, the Rice Museum said, um, take the first, took the first step and said, uh, we will create an open content uh, scheme that, so we will allow free access, unrestricted uh, reuse for all of our digitized images. And since uh, the Rijks Museum, many, many museums have joined, uh, but a decade later, it's still unclear which museums are on open content and from these museums, which artworks are out of copyright. And then there were quite a few museums trying to say we have an open access policy, while in reality they didn't. So because it was all unclear and because Museum, my PhD project, was still live and uh, the, its goal is to make art easily accessible. And essentially, you know, the pinnacle of accessibility on the internet, I guess, is having the own artwork to do whatever, you know, a, a, a digital version of this artwork and do whatever you want with it. Uh, you know, I did a lot, we did a lot of work to bring all those artworks together and take the stress from the end user. So at present, people can download uh, copyright free images. If you go on Wikimedia, you can download, you know, you can find images and download them uh, of paintings. But then Wikimedia, Wikipedia, you're bombarded with in the United States, this is the legal framework. But if you know little about law, you know, it doesn't go by count, you know, it doesn't go, it goes by country, you know, what applies in the States doesn't apply it in the EU or in the, in, in Britain. So uh, there were, I, I, I believe to my knowledge, I think Museum is the first platform that takes the stress out from the end user. So uh, for all artworks on Museum that the, the download button is enabled, people can download these images and do whatever they want with them. And if this is explicitly stated to them. So even if something happens, they can uh, put the blame back on Museum. That Museum told me I can do whatever I want with these images. And uh, so some, this was like a way to contribute to the promotion of these collections. So Museum does not try to convince anybody because some people say, but how do you, you know, how, why do museums do it? How do you convince you? And Museum is just the means to promote because museums have their own reasons to do that. So when uh, I met uh, Merete Sanderhoff, the person who led the open content movement, the open content uh, ski, um, policy for the Statens Museum Kunst, the National Gallery of Denmark, she was thrilled by museums. She said, if you have any stats, how many people download, uh, please do share, share them with me. So museums have their reasons to join Open Glam. Rijks Museum that started it, they did it because uh, they couldn't see, they couldn't afford to see any longer uh, super bad images of their artworks, and uh, so they, you know, the, the yellow yellow milkmaid ph ph phenomenon. You know, the, the milkmaid of Vermeer. Uh, there were like thousands and thousands of images of a yellowish version of it. So they said, if people are gonna 
they will find a way to get to you to find an image of an artwork that they like they should at least have the right person so yeah using is just a means to promote it so yeah sorry if i took too long <laughs> No, that's okay. This is this is all very interesting, and you opened up, you know, very many different topics that I don't think, you know, we have the time time yeah, to sure. discuss right now. Like, for example, you know, uh, why why do, do do we see museums like they are not actually reluctant? They they have these, uh, you know, uh, funding problems, uh, and then you know when you offer something that uh, uh, for which they do not need uh, to invest any money, and anyway they may not have any money to invest, then that may be a good solution. That may be, you know, a way for them to adapt, uh, you know, these new technologies. If they do not have to invest on hardware or software or, or, or anything like that, then that may be a good solution. But you also mentioned a lot, uh, you know, the aspect of of users. Okay, and there is a, you know, uh, it's it's so how users are different to visitors, how are different to the museum audience, and so on. That's that's another question. And more generally, I mean, how do people, how do the uh, the people who, who visit these museums or the virtual museums, how do they perceive these changes? What is their reaction? Tim, you have something to say on that? Uh, it wasn't quite on that, but it was just um, okay. qu a question I was gonna that goes back to some of the things at the start yeah, yeah, yeah. earlier yeah, sure. in, in in what Fatini was saying, which I was finding interesting about the idea of museums as late adopters of technologies. And I guess I was going to throw this out um, because the paradox uh, to to all of us a bit, the, the paradox to me a little bit is that artists aren't necessarily late adopters. Um, the example I, I guess I came across was because I was researching um, the 1990s uh, protests around the anti or alter globalization movement. I came across the early hacktivists and they were all artists groups who had were some of the first people deploying denial of service attacks for political reasons, critical art ensemble, electronic disturbance theater, and they remain artists who are engaged in technology. And they were really, and there are a number of others, Matthew Fuller's early work and so on. Um, so I suppose I was just gonna try and provoke some more debate around the nature of museums by asking if artists who are, you know, key influences on museums, on at least on things like the takes and so on, are early are often early adapt, adopters of this kind of stuff. What what's is it an institutional process? What's going on in museums that that is is making them later adopters adapters? Sorry. Does anyone know? Does anyone have an answer on this? <laughs> yeah, Kat. I'm just going to raise my physical hand rather than the digital <laughs> hand, if that's okay. Um, I, I guess just quickly because I'm sure everyone you know has some insight on this. From my research, I was interested to learn that actually a lot of the blockages are not are not actually from museum curators or workers or artists, but from the sort of systems of museums themselves, which are often very traditional and old fashioned and underfunded, as, as was mentioned. So most of the museums that I've worked with have had to look for external and corporate funding from technology companies like Samsung in order to do any kind of digital programs or any kind of sort of more creative experimental programs because there just isn't the in-house resource for that. So even though people working within museums are fighting to make them more experimental and more participatory and more open, that process is very slow because of these massive sort of behemoth like organizations that they work for, which are often quite hegemonic in their practices and processes. And that's why sort of the change much of the change is happening from within, but much slower than I personally would like to see. And I do think that, you know, artists play a key role in sort of inspiring the upper echelons of museums, you know, like, like the director level people who are often, I guess you could say them, the more traditional of the bunch, they, they help show these people that actually it, it is important to fund more experimental programs. So I think that the more experimental and radical art and, you know, sort of Hacktivist practices that are infused into museums, the better. Thank you, Kat. Angela, you have something to say on that? I just want to say a little story uh, that just builds on what Kat said. Once I was called by some archaeologists to um, try to provide solutions for some archaeological museums around Athens. They were all very keen and they were all very happy and they wanted to use technology. They wanted to go to the digital era because the museums look like uh, storage houses from the 1900s. 
So I went there and I talked to them many times and they had fantastic ideas and they were very willing to change. They were very willing to make take the extra time and uh, they put a lot of time and effort into this and we made together a proposal. So at some point I go to meet the director and she was the head administration, the director of uh, 35 museums, if I'm not mistaken, and a lot of archeological sites. The moment I step in and just, I just want to say they invited me. I, I did not invite myself, they invited me. So I go there and uh, she said, the first thing she said to me was, first of all, she said, technology has nothing to offer to archaeology. And on this basis, we can start discussing. So of course, as you, as you, as you say, low, the personnel inside the museums is happy to do something. But then when, when it comes to higher administration, the, the museum system from above, they feel that they will waste time and resources and they don't really need it. So they're not convinced. So the people working there, they see the necessity, but it comes to higher administration and then the whole thing stops. So uh, because that was a traumatic experience for me, I just wanted to share it. And do you think that, you know, it's what Fotini uh, talked about before that, you know, the, the, the museums have a feel or, or, you know, the people uh, in the higher administration levels of the museums, uh, you know, the museum has a specific, you know, mission or role. Has this changed or should this change, you know, with the recent changes in technology and everything? Or is it you know, that they can still accomplish this mission and they can do it even better with the new technology? Are you asking me? Or... Oh, well, I ask you, I, I can see you on my screen, so, <laughs> but any, anyone can answer. Angela or anyone, what do you think? Well, I think um, the, the, um, uh, the people at the the people that are running the show, they need to understand that the the circumstances, the social, um, the social environment is changing around them. They cannot stay on the same definition they had when they were first hired in the museum. So as they go up in the in the process, they go up in scale in the in the administration, and they get higher and higher positions. They need to understand that the world around them changes as well. So um, the museum definition has changed to incorporate uh, the technology and uh, the different, the different um, uh, technological solutions, but they need to change themselves. So it seems like they're changing slower than the that technology does, uh, which, is, uh, which is understandable. And then I think it has to do with the way uh, we train people, the humanities departments. Um, you have, we have this uh, specialization, we have people focusing in archaeology and history, and we do the same, we focus on technology, but we don't have a good understanding of the other person's perspective in the other world. So I think the, the story I said before maybe was also my mistake because I went there convinced, because I'm convinced they need technology, so I went there with an attitude that you need me, but obviously they did not know they needed me. So I, I made a mistake as well. So I'm approaching them as it, because I think they need me, but the way they, uh, they don't have an understanding of technology, they're a little bit afraid of technology and the way we are teaching people in universities has to change and to bring, uh, to have a lot more interdisciplinary work there. So I think these are the core reasons why people, the people don't have this training. So they don't see, um, they don't understand other, a discipline's perspective. Okay, um, a comment from Fotini before we go to the questions from the audience. Sorry, it took me a while to find a way to raise my virtual hand. Uh, just, I just want to say, I don't think museums should change their mission. I think they just need to realize that technology is a very, very, very powerful tool to help them achieve their mission. And uh, because that was the debate, oh, you know, Facebook is bad, Facebook is good, or, um, you know, Gwendolyn Reality is uh, whatever. You, rarely the message, the medium is the message, you know, as the old essay used to say, it's usually just a, just a means, you know, just a, just a tool that you can use it for a good reason, you can use it for a bad reason, it's a knife, you can cut the tomato, you can kill a person. So I just think now with COVID museums realize that, you know, tech is a powerful tool and we just have to find the right ways to make the most of it and to invest some of our, of our time, some of our few resources to figure out how we should do that. So. Okay, thank you for the me. We're running out of time. So, and we already have some questions from the audience. Uh, so, uh, Kalopi, do you want to, to help with this, with the questions? Yes, let me 
I go through them. So um, the first one, uh, what sort of digital skills do you feel that the next generation of museum professionals will need? Okay. Uh, so some things were mentioned already. Um, okay, before we go to the next one. Yes. Does anyone have an answer for that? I don't have an answer for that. I mean, okay, I'm working, I'm working, uh, you know, in some research projects where, uh, yeah, they now require very advanced skills. So, uh, you know, in a research, in a recent research proposal that I was involved in, they were looking for people, you know, with a PhD in machine learning uh, and a good understanding of, uh, you know, databases and knowledge bases and all these things. But I'm not, I'm not sure, you know, it was the nature of this proposal that required this kind of, but in general, what, what do you think? I mean, what sort of digital skills uh, do you feel that, uh, you know, the next generation of museum professionals will need, as the question says? Do they need to know AI? We don't know. <laughs> yeah, Kat. I, I would say that it really depends on the sort of area of museum practice or curatorial practice that you're going into because, you know, museum workers and uh, public programs, for example, often not as tech savvy as people in digital learning teams. But I do think that sort of across the board, there will be sort of a, a higher level of digital literacy now after COVID-19 and so many of us working from home and realizing that we need to, you know, find new ways to engage than before. So I, I think perhaps you could see it as using this current moment as an opportunity to play around with some of the digital tools that you can use to engage audiences and to engage with museums, just so that if you were to work in a museum, you could bring those skills because I think museums will now have a greater consciousness of the need for them. So, you know, uh, augmented reality tech, virtual reality tech, online digital platforms of which we could we could list many that, that are being used by museums now. I think having sort of a fluency in these will be a real benefit in the future. Yeah, or, or at least I, I would say, you know, a good awareness of these technologies so that people are not afraid of these technologies, as Angela said, and they're more, you know, it's more easy for them to accept them. A good awareness of what we can do with these technologies. They do not have to know how to develop these technologies. Anyway, um, um, I just quickly, uh, just very quickly come in. I think also we need to think about there's two things that I like to add. One is that um, Kat just mentioned augmented reality, and that's really cracked open. Pokemon Go and um, the Harry Potter Wizarding Worlds have cracked that open to mass market. So that's something that museums, I think, will have to start thinking a bit about. Um, the other thing is to think about other parts of the world that we'll be looking at. So, for example, if you go to, to uh, China, you'll find the use of QR codes is far more extensive than it is here um, because it relates to forms of payment and ways of doing things. And you'll probably find that the use of digital skills, digital literacy is far more advanced than here. Um, and so we might need in some ways to start looking at other places and get outside of, um, you know, our kind of bubble of the things that we know, know best to see some of these new things. Good. Thank you, Tim. Um, let, let's, let's, let's look at the other question. So, Kayopi. There is another question related to the museum workforce, uh, if we can yeah. uh, call. Uh, so many museums work with an active and well-informed group of volunteers. Uh, how might their expertise and capacity assist the virtual museum? Any comment from anyone on this? Uh, very briefly, I did mention yeah. the kind of um, uh, crowdsourcing kind of things earlier on. So I think there's also a, a shift potentially in the nature of volunteers um, from, you know, physically present people to people who can actually help in some ways co-produce um, content for the, and, and that that's hit, a bit hit and miss, but when it works, it can be very powerful. Yeah, Angela. And I think uh, these volunteers are normally, they're very resourceful people. So, um, and they are experienced in working with the public and working with the museum. So I think they can shift to the virtual work if they have the proper training. And obviously they need to, uh, they need to be uh, willing to do it. So not everybody will be ready to start working in the digital world. But I think they're, from what I've seen, they're highly resourceful people. So I think it will be quite easy for them with a short training to go to this new um, reality. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And I was, I'm, I'm, I'm supervising a PhD uh, who are, who is uh, focusing on a, on a small museum in London. Uh, and um, 
And one of the things that this PhD is looking at is that you know the role of volunteers, uh, and um, it's it's the PhD is you know open glam and about you know how uh, the uh, small museums can uh, can adapt uh, you know all these things of the open glam movement and if this is actually beneficial to them and so on. But it's also looking at the role of volunteers and the volunteers. I mean, based on that experience at least, uh, yeah, as you said. They are happy to be involved in these uh, in these processes. They are happy to uh, help the museum go this way. Uh, they were involved in digitization projects of the museum and, and and so on. But they said they all admitted that they need some training. Uh, for example, they were not aware at all of what uh, you know of what the licenses mean. Okay, so that's one thing that they couldn't understand. So they were not able to understand you know the. Um, uh, the, the the impact of changing the licensings of something or the impact of, of publishing something online. So yes, they need training. I completely agree with that. But they can definitely help. Uh, you said, Angela. So, Kayopi, we have one more quick thing. We have one more. Yes. Bear with me because there was one more coming in. Okay. So in terms of the gamerization, if I pronounce it properly, of the sector, would you say this includes the recent shift by big London museums towards gaming and internet pop culture as the subject of major exhibitions, for example, the manga exhibition at the British Museum or the video games at the VNA? Um, do you have an answer on that? Yeah. Mm. I'll, I'll do a bit of a start, but that's some others might come. Yeah. Um, I definitely, I mean, I think there's a couple of things going on there and a couple of things to pay attention to. One is just uh, big high art, high culture institutions trying to deal with the importance of what might not be considered high culture, might be considered part of pop or popular culture of various sorts. Um, so it's kind of undeniable that games have gone from being a kind of forbidden uh, zone in high culture kind of places to being something that it's undeniable that we need to, to look at. Um, gamification comes in a number of flavors. Mm -hmm. I think one thing I guess I'd just point to is that I found interesting was that that manga exhibition, which uh, mm. personally I really enjoyed, um, was itself somewhat gamified in the way it was presented. It was kind of had a kind of theme parkish kind of feel to it. Um, uh, you know, I could have could have been a kind of high art um, ex Disney employee designing some of the the kind of the ways that it, the way it was. So that gamerization, I think you're right, is probably something about. Um, it's not just the content of the exhibitions; it's also the form of exhibitions mm. sometimes that's coming about, and that that's coming about, and the, the standards that people expect. You know, uh, if they've been to certain theme parks that are coming into these. Um, uh, so that's yeah. Sorry. So I was just thinking about form and content it, are both along those kinds of lines. I think. Thank you, Tim. Um, if we don't have any other comments on that, I, I would like, you know, if possible, to answer all uh, the questions from the audience. So, Kalyobi, do we have another one? So the next one is for uh, the use of social media. So social media and the digital sphere. How have they affected the actual content of exhibitions, if at all? What implications will it have on culture if museums move away from a more traditional art historical approach to one that is geared towards participation? Okay, so we're, we so the question is about the implications on, on culture itself, mm. and, and that's a big question <laughs> because yeah, Angela, I haven't done any research on this. But um, my feeling is that it has affected very much the, the, the content, the way we design content. For example, a few years ago, we used to have this very formal um, in, uh, information labels under the exhibits, at least in archaeological museums. And they had, they said, oh, this is a fifth century BC marble, blah, 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 found there and there. It was very formal. And that has changed. What people expect now is more, per, not per, more personal narratives. And I think this is related to what they see on Facebook and, and the, what they see on social media. They want this kind of quicker and more engaging content. And they will not bother to read huge labels and um, information panels. So I think it has affected them definitely, the way that people engage and interact with social media. It has changed the content, but also the interaction style. 
Um, so people are expecting to have some kind of interaction with the cultural content. They want to put a smiley or a thumbs up uh, something. They want to be able to do something. So, so it's cross cult. Remember, we had this. We had a very quick way of evaluating uh, the different stories we created, and people seem to prefer the smiley faces and thumbs up function rather than leaving a comment and write, "Oh, I like this" or "I didn't like this." So people are definitely affected by the um, uh, the social media. Media and the, the use of social media. So it, it, will, it will definitely affect the, um, uh, the domain. Yeah, Kat. Uh, I think just, just to add to what you, you've said, I think that uh, one way to articulate this is through the, the theory of the experience economy, um, which I can, I can put an article about it in the chat. And, and basically this is the, an idea that, that as museums become sort of more and more like theme parks and, and as people expect more and more participation from museums, then people become more used to that participation and that becomes sort of the status quo or the norm of, of what a museum collection starts to offer because people are, you know, so engaged with, with digital and sort of television media already that that is more and more participatory. But I would say that this is actually quite a good thing because we are trying to diversify museum access and engagement. And I would say that, you know, sort of providing exciting exhibits, sort of like the manga exhibit that Tim is talking about is, is one way that people who might not otherwise feel welcome to go into a museum, if it's only, you know, a fine artworks, maybe they don't know anything about, you know, like going into the museum through the vector of a manga exhibit and then seeing, you know, the high art, more traditional artworks after to me is a perfect sort of situation. And um, I showed a, um, it's called Spiral JP and it's a filter on Instagram that a museum in Japan has used um, and they've had great success with. And, and what it does is it takes um, some of their more classical artworks and puts it around people's faces so that they can sort of immerse themselves in the artwork while taking a selfie, which I think sort of um, maybe traditional art historians might uh, be really horrified by. But actually when you see people's engagements with these old artworks that they might not know anything about otherwise, it, it's a really nice process that's sort of more symbiotic and more, more two-way where people are actually placing themselves in sort of an artistic space in ways that they haven't before. So I personally would like to see more of that. Thank you, Kat. And we have one more question. So yes, I love it's specifically for 3D, yes, for 3D models. So how do you think about the fact that 3D model of museums antiques sometimes can be faked, for example? After 3D, there we go. After 3D scanning, these models need to be colored by pasting some pictures of surfaces of its original objects. But sometimes workers will be lazy on doing this process, editing the pictures to follow the shapes of models. Therefore, they build another model of the antique and send it in in digital display spaces like virtual museums. Anyone on this? Anyone having an answer on this? On the Friday night at this time, having a discussion <laughs> about what's an original and what's a Thanks. fake, and what's a simulacrum, <laughs> um, is slightly testing my brain. I have to yeah, agree. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I think it's really interesting. I think that's what it, the, for me. That's the issue it raises: what's the original and what's the fake in this context, and what. What is the 3D model trying to do would be the other question. And I guess in some cases it's trying to mimic exactly, in which case it's an issue. In other cases, maybe it's providing a different kind of experience. Um, uh, but that's about, that's about as most, much as I can get together at this point. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. And, and with this point, you know, uh, what's a real and what's the fake and so on. So that, uh, you know, reminds me of the topic of this week. What's the physical, what's the virtual, what's the local, what's the global, everything is, is blurred right now. And that, and that brings us to the end of this, of this discussion and then this uh, week. Uh, so our team, Kat, Angela and, and Fotimi, thank you very much for, for uh, participating in this discussion. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, it was, uh, that we did well. <laughs> people were engaged, people asked questions. So that means that, you know, uh, they, were, they were listening to us. Uh, so that was good. Many thanks for, to the audience for, for uh, you know, very, very interesting questions. Uh, many thanks to all the people who helped, you know, with this event. Uh, Kalopi, thank you very much 
for helping with the question. Uh, Georgina Bolton, Dan Bolton, Jessica Thomas, and of course, uh, uh, Tim, Tim Bisley Murray, the curator of this uh, whole series of uh, Inspiring Mind uh, Welcome Season events. Uh, next week is the last week uh, of the Inspiring Minds Welcome Season. And the theme is uh, um, imagining better futures so that, you know, may bring an optimistic uh, view uh, to, the, to the future. Uh, be three exciting events, a reading group on uh, Go and Go Ask the Time, a discussion on the film Arrival, and a panel on the role of the arts and humanities in imagining uh, better futures. So you're all, of course, uh, you know, invited to these events. Please uh, subscribe and attend uh, next week events. Uh, I'm sure you will enjoy them. Uh, so thank you all for staying until, you know, uh, until this late. Uh, thank you again all for participating in this panel. Uh, have a good evening or a good morning if you're in some other place in the world or a good afternoon and uh, have a good weekend. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you guys. Bye.